The Romance of Marcia by Margaret Sangster. You see that little stone house with the roses climbing over it? said my companion, indicating with a gesture the place she meant. We were driving together in the uplands of Virginia, and the time of the year was the sunny month of June. I shall stop there and make a call on the lady who has lived there for the fifty years of her life. It is the house where Miss Marcia was born. After we have gone, I will tell you her story. I think it will interest you. We drove through a long lane skirting a pasture, where a Jersey cow was grazing, and presently we drew rein at the door. A lady sitting in the porch rose and greeted my friend most cordially, shaking hands with me very kindly, too. Any friend of Mrs. Meredith is more than welcome under this roof, she said. Sophie Meredith and I have been friends ourselves in sunshine and in shade since we were children. We sat a while in the porch, and then a little colored maid came to the door and said something in a low voice to her mistress. The latter rose. Come in and taste my spice cakes and have a glass of milk, she urged hospitably. Mountain air tends toward a good appetite, and we needed no such bidding. Though the rooms were small, they were furnished with a certain splendor, and had an air unusual in the region where I was visiting. Rich, dark rugs and colors dim and somber covered the floors. The heavy mahogany tables and chairs were polished until they shone like mirrors. And everywhere, in dining room, drawing room, passages and alcoves, there were books and pictures. My attention was drawn to the books, for though I had no time for more than a glance, I saw that the library in this house was an inheritance, that it had come to its present owner from book lovers who had finished their earthly course and left behind the things that were precious to them here. When our call was ended and we were on the road again and beyond sight and hearing, I said impulsively, Isn't she beautiful? And her home is a dream. Do tell me about Miss Marcia. Does she live there alone? Alone, except for old Dilsey, our cook, and Phoebe, Dilsey's daughter, who is her little waiting maid. Yes, she is beautiful, and so is her house. And now, I'll let Dan fare on at his own pace while I tell you about her. Judge Peyton, Marcia's father, had a young fellow studying law with him some thirty years ago, when Marcia was a radiant creature of twenty. Mrs. Peyton died in Marcia's childhood, and Marcia was mistress of the house. She was greatly admired. All the young men in the countryside were her devoted followers, as our courtly southern fashion dictates, and Marcia might have had her pick. But she was fancy-free, and though our girls marry young, and did marry at even younger age then than now, Marcia managed to keep her train as friends, but held them off as lovers. Until John Lansing, the law student, came, I mean. But John was the one who had the key to her heart, and the two were presently engaged. The wedding day was set. Marcia's trousseau was ready. She has a trunk up in the garret where she could show you, yellowed now, the soft white mull trimmed with point lace, which was to have been her wedding gown. It lies there, soft and dainty, with the gloves and satin slippers, all meant for the slim girl whose sylph-like figure they fitted. Well, well, well. My friend stopped to take breath. I thought of Miss Marcia, ample, stately, with the beauty of her meridian, and of the youthful, lissome grace of the girl she once was, and I too said, well, well. But I added, pray go on, something happened. What was it? Did John die? Die? No, said Mrs. Meredith. Judge Peyton had a stroke of paralysis, just a light stroke, but it changed his life and Marcia's. It muddled up his mind. He forgot things and grew cross and irritable. Then came another stroke and he was laid aside helpless. He had a successive stroke and lived in utter helplessness for ten years. Marcia refused to leave her father. John Lansing's career waited for him in a northern state. He was not willing. Indeed, he said that family reasons forbade his settling in Virginia. I always blamed him, for does not scripture say that a man must leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife? But John was resolute. He offered to have the judge taken north, to have caretakers for him, to do whatever money could do, but he wanted Marcia to marry him as had been planned. Marcia was like a rock herself. She would never leave her father while he lived nor disturb him, nor carry him away from his native place. In the end, John gave up pleading. Five years later than the day that would have been Marcia's bridal day, they broke the engagement. The judge died ten years later. I mean, ten years later than the wedding day that never was, and five years after the broken betrothal. The very week of his funeral, word came that John Lansing had married in Boston. So, that is all there is to tell. Marcia has never seen anyone she could love, and she is too strong and steadfast a woman to mope.
She is the good angel of our region, and she lives in that grey stone house all alone. I don't see that Mr. Lansing was so much in fault, I said. Marcia seems to have been unreasonable. Her father did not need her after his mind had failed. At least, not if he could have been well cared for. One never knows, said Mrs. Meredith. There are gleams of consciousness, flashes in the mental gloom, and Marcia felt that her duty kept her by her father. She could not go against her conscience. Time passed, and one day, a year after this southern visit, I found myself in a New England town. At a church gathering one evening, where people from several boroughs and villages were present, I met a very beautiful young woman, the wife of the pastor. She was so sweet and wholesome, so bright and attractive, that my heart went out to her, and I thought her not only wonderfully charming, but ideally fitted to occupy the place of minister's wife, which not every woman adorns. And, taking it for all in all, a gracious and winsome wife is a gift from the Lord to a minister, and has a good deal to do with helping him to successful work in his parish. We had been chatting pleasantly for some minutes, when a tall, distinguished-looking gentleman with iron-gray hair, crowning a fine, well-set head, approached us. "'I am commissioned to escort you home, Ethel,' he said. "'Your husband has another meeting after these good friends go, and fears you will be tired.' "'Let me present my father, Mr. Lansing,' said the lady." It transpired before long that this was Marcia's John Lansing and no other, for Mrs. Dean went on to say, Father, Mrs. M. has spent a good many months in Blue Haven, where you studied when you were a boy. She may know some of your old friends. The little lady flitted off to find her husband and speak with him, and to put on her wraps. In that interval, Mr. Lansing addressed me directly. Pardon a strange question from a stranger, but did you by any chance, when in Blue Haven, Hear anything of the last of the Paytons, Miss Marcia, who married Eugene Brearley some years ago? I met Miss Payton, I answered, but she is Miss Payton still. She has never married. I met the Brearleys, too. Mrs. Brearley is a Richmond woman, and was very like a Payton. I do not know. I had a heavenly youth in Blue Haven, said Mr. Lansing as his daughter returned, apologetic and flushed because she had been detained. And Miss Marcia Payton was once a very dear friend. Later I learned that Mrs. Dean was an only child, and that Mr. Lansing had long been a widower, and that he had attained eminence in his profession and accumulated wealth, but I saw no more of him during my brief stay in that neighborhood. The end, or the second sweet beginning, of Miss Marsh's romance was told me some months afterward in a letter from Mrs. Meredith. Well, dearest, it ran, I am at this moment home from a wedding. Whose, do you ask? Of all women in the world, Marcia Payton's. She was married to her old lover, John Lansing, at noon today. The bride was dressed in dove-colored satin and looked so happy and peaceful, as if no storm had ever touched her or ever could. As for John, he bore himself like a king of men. It appears that he was not so much to blame as I used to think. Before the breaking of that old engagement, he wrote Marcia a letter, offering to live in Blue Haven, help her care for her father, or do anything else she asked if she would but marry him. That letter, with the fiendish perversity of inanimate things, lost itself in a corner of the judge's library, and was slipped back between a bookcase and the wall. Marcia never received it, through someone's carelessness at first, no doubt. Consequently, she ignored it, and this hurt John, and led to the friction, which in turn led to the rupture of their ties. John married a sweet girl who adored him, and with whom he was happy. Some years ago, his wife died. But he had an impression that Marcia was married, so he never sought to see her again. He lived by himself after the marriage of his only child, and quite recently he discovered that Marcia Payton was yet free, and after thirty years of absence he came to pay her a visit. As Providence mercifully ordained it, the very day John knocked at Marcia's door, a bit of the library ceiling had fallen, loosening the particular bookcase which had all along concealed John's old letter. Marcia had read it, kissed it, and cried over it, when, as if stepping out of a fairy tale, in walked the hero of the story, as large as life. I don't know, I'm sure, what arguments he used to persuade her, but he took rooms at the inn and settled fairly down to courting his old sweetheart. She was not easily won, for she said their ways had been apart and their habits had become fixed, and that she, at least, was too old to be any man's wife. She, indeed, superb as she is. Any man of the proper age might be proud to win her, and John Lansing is proud, for he pressed his suit eagerly, and Marcia Payton said yes at last. His daughter and her husband were at the wedding and seemed well pleased. Mrs. Dean told me she had been anxious in her own home, lest her father should be too lonely in his great house all by himself. They sail tomorrow, the Lansings, I mean, 
for Europe to be gone six months. Then they will spend some part of each year here in Marcia's old home. Has it not all ended satisfactorily? And though they miss their life's June together, they will have their Indian summer. End of The Romance of Marcia by Margaret Sangster. Captain Venino's Proposal of Marriage "'Great heavens, what a woman!' cried the captain, and stamped with fury. "'Not without reason have I been trembling and in fear of her from the first time I saw her. "'It must have been a warning of fate that I stopped playing a cart with her. "'It was also a bad omen that I passed so many sleepless nights. "'Was there ever mortal in a worse perplexity than I am? "'How can I leave her alone without a protector, loving her as I do, more than my own life? And on the other hand, how can I marry her after all my declaimings against marriage? Then, turning to Augustus, what would they say of me in the club? What would people say of me if they met me in the street with a woman on my arm? Or if they found me at home, just about to feed a child in swaddling clothes? I, to have children, to worry about them, to live in eternal fear that they might fall sick or die. Augustus, believe me, as true as there is a God above us, I am absolutely unfit for it. I should behave in such a way that after a short while you would call upon heaven either to be divorced or to become a widow. Listen to my advice. Do not marry me, even if I ask you. "'What a strange creature you are,' said the young woman, without allowing herself to be at all discomposed, and sitting very erect in her chair. "'All that you are only telling to yourself. From what do you conclude that I wish to be married to you, that I would accept your offer, or that I should not prefer living by myself, even if I had to work day and night, as so many girls do who are orphans?' "'How do I come to that conclusion?' answered the captain with great candor. "'Because it cannot be otherwise. "'Because we love each other. "'Because we are drawn to each other. "'Because a man such as I and a woman such as you "'cannot live in any other way. "'Do you suppose I do not understand that? "'Don't you suppose I have reflected on it before now? "'Do you think I am indifferent to your good name and reputation?' I have spoken plainly in order to speak, in order to fly from my own conviction, in order to examine whether I can escape from this terrible dilemma which is robbing me of my sleep, and whether I can possibly find an expedient so that I need not marry you, to do which I shall finally be compelled if you stand by your resolve to make your way alone. <laughs> alone? Alone? repeated Augustus roguishly. And why not with a worthier companion? Who tells you that I shall not some day meet a man whom I like, and who is not afraid to marry me? Augustus, let us skip that, growled the captain, his face turning scarlet. And why should we not talk about it? Let us pass over that, and let me say at the same time that I will murder the man who dares to ask for your hand. But it is madness on my part to be angry without any reason. I am not so dull as not to see how we two stand. Shall I tell you? We love each other. Do not tell me I am mistaken. That would be lying. And here is the proof. If you did not love me, I too should not love you. Let us try to meet one another halfway. I ask for a delay of ten years. When I shall have completed my half-century, and when a feeble old man, I shall have become familiar with the idea of slavery, then we will marry without anyone knowing about it. We will leave Madrid and go to the country where we shall have no spectators, where there will be nobody to make fun of me. But until this happens, please take half of my income secretly and without any human soul ever knowing anything about it. You continue to live here, and I remain in my house. We will see each other, but only in the presence of witnesses, for instance, in society. We will write to each other every day. So as not to endanger your good name, I will never pass through this street, and on Memorial Day only we will go to the cemetery together with Rosa. Augustus could not but smile at the last proposal of the good captain, and her smile was not mocking, but contented and happy, as if some cherished hope had dawned in her heart, 
as if it were the first ray of the sun of happiness, which was about to rise in her heaven. But being a woman, though as brave and free from artifices as few of them, she yet managed to subdue the signs of joy rising within her. She acted as if she cherished not the slightest hope, and said with a distant coolness, which is usually the special and genuine sign of chaste reserve, "'You make yourself ridiculous with your peculiar conditions. You stipulate for the gift of an engagement ring for which nobody has yet asked you. I know still another way out for a compromise, but that is really the last one.' Do you fully understand, my young lady from Aragon, it is the last way out which a man also from Aragon begs leave to explain to you? She turned her head and looked straight into his eyes, with an expression indescribably earnest, captivating, quiet, and full of expectation. The captain had never seen her features so beautiful and expressive. At that moment she looked to him like a queen. Augustus said, or rather stammered, this brave soldier, who had been under fire a hundred times, and who had made such a deep impression on the young girl through his charging under a rain of bullets like a lion. I have the honor to ask for your hand on one certain essential unchangeable condition. Tomorrow morning, today, as soon as the papers are in order, as quickly as possible, I can live without you no longer. The glances of the young girl became milder, and she rewarded him for his decided heroism with a tender and bewitching smile. But I repeat, that is on one condition, the bold warrior hastened to repeat, feeling that Augustia's glances made him confused and weak. On what condition, asked the young girl, turning fully round and now holding him under the witchery of her sparkling black eyes. Um, on the condition, he stammered, that in case we have children, we send them to the orphanage. I mean, on this point, I will never yield. Well, do you consent? For heaven's sake, say yes. Why should I not consent to it? <laughs> Captain Venino answered Augustus with a peal of laughter. You shall take them there yourself, or better still, we both of us will take them there and we will give them up without kissing them or anything else. Don't you think we shall take them there? Thus spoke Augustus, and looked at the captain with exquisite joy in her eyes. The good captain thought he would die of happiness. A flood of tears burst from his eyes. He folded the blushing girl in his arms and said, So I am lost. Irretrievably lost, Captain Venino, answered Augustus. One morning in May, 1852, that is, four years after the scene just described, a friend of mine who told me the story stopped his horse in front of a mansion on San Francisco Avenue in Madrid. He threw the reins to his groom and asked the long-coated footman who met him at the door, Is your master at home? If your honor will be good enough to walk upstairs, you will find him in the library. His Excellency does not like to have visitors announced. Everybody can go up to him directly. Fortunately, I know the house thoroughly, said the stranger to himself, while he mounted the stairs. In the library, well, well, who would have thought of Captain Venino ever taking to the sciences? Wandering through the rooms, the visitor met another servant who repeated, The master is in the library. And at last he came to the door of the room in question, opened it quickly, and stood, almost turned to stone for astonishment, before the remarkable group which it offered to his view. In the middle of the room, on the carpet which covered the floor, a man was crawling on all fours. On his back rode a little fellow about three years old, who was kicking the man's sides with his heels. Another small boy, who might have been a year and a half old, stood in front of the man's head and had evidently been tumbling his hair. One hand held the father's neckerchief, and the little fellow was tugging at it as if it had been a halter, shouting with delight in his merry child's voice, Gee up, donkey, gee up! End of Captain Venino's Proposal of Marriage The Writer by Maxim Gorky there once lived a very ambitious writer 
When he was abused, it seemed to him that he was abused too much and unjustly. When he was praised, he thought that they neither praised him enough nor wisely. He lived in a state of perpetual discontent until the time came for him to die. The writer lay down on his bed and began grumbling. That's just how it is. What do you think of it? Two novels are not yet finished, and altogether I have enough material for ten years. The devil take this law of nature, and every other law. What nonsense! The novels might have turned out well. Why have they invented this idiotic compulsory service, as if things could not have been arranged differently? And it always comes at the wrong time. The novels are not finished yet. Well, he was angry, but disease was eating into his bones and whispering into his ears. You trembled, eh? Why did you tremble? You don't sleep at night, eh? Why don't you sleep? You have drunk of sorrow, eh? And of joy, too. He kept knitting his brows, but realized at last that nothing could be done. With a wave of the arm, he dismissed the thought of his novels and died. It was so very disagreeable, but he died. So far, so good. They washed him, dressed him according to custom, combed his hair, and placed him on the table, straight and stiff like a soldier, heels together, toes apart. He lay very still, his nose drooped, and the only feeling he had was surprise. How strange it is that I feel nothing at all. It's the first time in my life. Ah, my wife is crying. Well, now you cry, but before, when anything went wrong, you flew into a rage. My little son is crying, too. No doubt he will grow up a good-for-nothing fellow. The sons of writers, I have noticed, always do. No doubt that also is in accordance with some law of nature. What an infernal number of such laws there are. So he lay and thought and thought and wondered at his composure. He was not accustomed to it. They started for the cemetery, but as he was being borne along, he suddenly felt there were not enough mourners. No matter, he said to himself, though I may not be a very great writer, literature must be respected. He looked out of the coffin and saw that, as a matter of fact, without counting his relations, only nine people accompanied him among whom are two beggars and a lamplighter with a ladder over his shoulder. At this discovery he became quite indignant. What swine! The slight so incensed him that he immediately became resurrected, and, being a small man, jumped unperceived out of his coffin. He ran into a barber's, had his mustache and beard shaved off, and borrowed a black coat with a patch under the armpit, leaving his own coat in its stead. Then he made his face look solemn and aggrieved, and became like a living man. It was impossible to recognize him. With the curiosity natural to his profession, he asked the barber, Are you not astonished at this strange incident? The latter stroked his mustache condescendingly and replied, Well, we live in Russia and we are used to all kinds of things. But then I am a deceased person, and suddenly I change my attire? It is the fashion of the times, and in what way are you a deceased person? Only externally. As far as the general run of people goes, it would be better if God made them all like you. At the present time, living people don't look half so natural. Don't I look rather yellowish? Quite in the spirit of the epoch, as you should be. It is Russia. Everyone here suffers from one ill or another. It is well known that barbers are flatterers of the first order and the most obliging people on earth. He bade him good-bye and ran to overtake the coffin, 
moved by a keen desire to show for the last time his reverence for literature. He caught up with the procession, and the number of those who accompanied the coffin became ten. The respect for the writer increased correspondingly. Passers-by exclaimed, astonished, Just look, a writer's funeral! Oh, oh! And people who knew what was taking place thought with a sort of pride as they went about their business. It is plain that the importance of literature is being understood better and better by the country. The writer was now following his own coffin as if he were an admirer of literature and a friend of the deceased. He addressed the lamplighter. Did you know the deceased person? Certainly. I made use of him in a small way. I am very pleased to hear it. Yes, our work is like that of the sparrow. Where something drops, we pick it up. How am I to understand that? Take it in a very simple manner, sir. In a simple manner? Yes, certainly, of course. It is a sin if one looks at it from a certain point of view. One cannot, however, get on in this world without using one's wits. Hmm. Are you sure of that? Quite sure, sir. There was a lamp right against his window, and every night he sat up till sunrise. Well, I did not light that lamp because enough light streamed from his window. So this one lamp was a net profit to me. He was a very useful man. So talking quietly to this one and that, the writer reached the cemetery, and it came to pass that he had to make a speech about himself, because all those who had accompanied him on that day had toothaches. This happens in Russia. And there, people always have an ache of one sort or another. He made a rather good speech. One paper went so far as to praise it in the following terms. One of the followers, who from his appearance we judged to be an actor, made a warm and touching oration over the grave, albeit from our point of view he no doubt overestimated and exaggerated the rather modest merits of the deceased. He was a writer of the old school who made no effort to rid himself of its defects, the naive didactism, namely, and the over-insistence on the so-called civic duties, which to us nowadays have become so tiresome. Nevertheless, the speech was delivered with a feeling of unquestionable love for the written word. When the speech had been duly made, the writer lay down in the coffin and thought, quite satisfied with himself, There, we are ready now. Everything has gone well and with dignity. At this point he became quite dead. Thus, should one's calling be respected, even though it be literature. End of The Writer by Maxim Gorky Love Letters of Margaret Fuller 1845 through 1846. Waverly Place, Sunday afternoon, 6th April, 1845. Can my friend have a doubt as to the nature of my answer? Could the heart of woman refuse its sympathy to this earnestness in behalf of an injured woman? Could a human heart refuse its faith to such sincerity, even if it had accompanied the avowal of error? Heaven be praised that it does not some of your expressions, especially the use of the word atonement, had troubled me. I knew not what to think. Now I know all, and surely all is well. The first day we passed together, as you told me of your first being here, when you came to the telling the landlord so ingenuously that you had no money, and said the tears ran down my boyish cheeks, my heart sprang toward you, and across the interval of years, and I stood beside you and wiped away those tears and told you they were pearls consecrated to truth. You said you would not do so now, but I believe you would act now with the same truthfulness, though in a different manner as becomes the man, according to the degree in which circumstances should call on you. And so it is. There are no tears nor cause to shed any. I need not approach so tenderly as I might have to the boy. 
but if it be of avail to bless you, to express a fervent hope that your great and tender soul may harmonize all your nature more and more, and create to itself a life in which it may expand all its powers, this hope, this blessing take from the one in whom you have confided, and never again fear that such an experiment may fail. Indeed, I have suffered much since receiving the letter. I came into town yesterday with that winged feeling that often comes with the early sunshine. When the letter came, I could not wait, and though there was only time for a glance upon it, a cold faintness came upon me. I took off the flowers I had put on, expressive of my feelings a little hour before, and gave them to the blind girl, for I almost envied her for being in her shut-up state, less subject to the sudden shocks of feeling. For there I read at once the exact confirmation of what had been told to me of your position, and could not read the whole, to be soothed by its sense and spirit. For this day had been given to others, and the evening to a circle of new acquaintance. Not till I went to my room for the night was there any peace or stillness, and all things swam before me, so I felt the falsity of the position in which you had placed yourself, that you had acted a fiction and, though from honorable, nay, from heroic motives, had endured the part of a rogue. I felt, too, that you had probably been tempted by the romance of the position, and with a firmer, clearer determination to acknowledge with simplicity, might have found some other way. I placed the letter next to my heart, and all day it seemed to comfort me and assure me that when I would be once alone, peace would come, and it has come. As to our relations, I wish these circumstances to make no difference in them in private, nor as to being together in public. Now that I know all and have made up my own mind, I have no fear nor care. I am myself exposed to misconstruction constantly from what I write. Blame cannot hurt me, for I have not done wrong, and have too much real weight of character to be sunk, unless by real stones of offense being attached to me. As I feel for myself, so do I for a friend. You are noble. I have elected to abide by you. We will act as if these clouds were not in the sky. My feeling with you was so delightful. It was a feeling of childhood. I was pervaded by the ardor, upborne by the strength of your nature, gently drawn near to the realities of life. I should have been happy to be thus led by the hand through green and sunny paths, or like a child to creep close to the side of my companion, listening long to his stories of things unfamiliar to my thoughts. Now this deeper strain has been awakened. It proves indeed an unison, but will the strings ever vibrate to the lighter airs again? And now farewell, come to see me so soon as you will and may. Farewell and love ever your friend. P.S. I stay here today, but go back to the farm tomorrow morning. As to your letter, I cannot yet part with it. At present, it is safe as myself, and before you go, shall be disposed of as you desire. I feel as if I had not expressed enough my deep interest in what you have done, but it was because of beginning with a sense that you must know that, and the wish to satisfy you as to myself. You will read, I believe, what was left unwritten. End of Letter 15 A short story by Ernest Hemingway One hot evening in Milan they carried him up onto the roof, and he could look out over the top of the town. There were chimney swifts in the sky. After a while it got dark and the searchlights came out. The others went down and took the bottles with them. He and Ag could hear them below on the balcony. Ag sat on the bed. She was cool and fresh in the hot night. Ag stayed on night duty for three months. They were glad to let her. When they operated on him, she prepared him for the operating table, and they had a joke about friend or enema. He went under the anesthetic, holding tight on to himself so that he would not blab about anything during the silly, talky time. After he got on crutches, he used to take the temperature so Ag would not have to get up from the bed. There were only a few patients, and they all knew about it. They all liked Ag. As he walked back along the halls, he thought of Ag in his bed. Before he went back to the front, they went into the Duomo and prayed. 
It was dim and quiet, and there were other people praying. They wanted to get married, but there was not enough time for the bands, and neither of them had birth certificates. They felt as though they were married, but they wanted everyone to know about it, and to make it so they could not lose it. Ag wrote him many letters that he never got until after the armistice. Fifteen came in a bunch, and he sorted them by the dates and read them all straight through. They were about the hospital and how much she loved him and how it was impossible to get along without him and how terrible it was missing him at night. After the armistice, they agreed he should go home to get a job so that they might get married. Ag would not come home until he had a good job and could come to New York to meet her. So understood he would not drink, and he did not want to see his friends or anyone in the States, only to get a job and be married. On the train from Padova to Milan, they quarreled about her not being willing to come home at once. When they had to say goodbye in the station at Padova, they kissed goodbye, but were not finished with the quarrel. He felt sick about saying goodbye like that. He went to America on a boat from Genoa. Ag went back to Torre di Mosta to open a hospital. It was lonely and rainy there, and there was a battalion of Arditi quartered in the town. Living in the muddy, rainy town in the winter, the major of the battalion made love to Ag, and she had never known Italians before. And finally wrote a letter to the States that theirs had been only a boy and girl affair. She was sorry, and she knew he would probably not be able to understand, but might some day forgive her and be grateful to her. And she expected absolutely unexpectedly to be married in the spring. She loved him as always, but she realized now it was only a boy and girl love. She hoped he would have a great career and believed in him absolutely. She knew it was for the best. The Major did not marry her in the spring or any other time. Ag never got an answer to her letter to Chicago about it. A short time after, he contracted gonorrhea from a salesgirl from the fair riding in a taxicab through Lincoln Park. End of a short story by Ernest Hemingway. Cupid at Forty by Mrs. Florence Skirton Tuttle At last, it begins to look more like a Christmas tree and less like a cemetery evergreen, Miss Winslow exclaimed, stepping back in the artist fashion to survey her work and feeling her aesthetic nature sensuously soothed by the sight of green-fringed, tinsel-laden branches against the rich crimson of the library walls. I was born with an eye for backgrounds. She took up a fat wax cupid, silver-winged, and equipped with quiver and darts, and looked at him speculatively, before soaring up the step-ladder to place him at the apex of the tree. "'Have you shafts that will pierce the world-worn heart of forty? she inquired whimsically. "'And would you have loved Psyche, had she ceased to be perennially young? "'Old age! Ugh! Oh, she shivered daintily. "'Miss Winslow was a middle-aged belle. "'She was forty, and carried her years with an engaging lightness, "'which was the marvel of her set. "'She was rich, consequently popular to the point of envy.' charming, and therefore possessed a few friends who loved her for herself. Yet on Christmas Eve, when all the world was sung by echoing bells into temporary tranquility, Miss Winslow's heart was not at peace. Holidays are horrible resurrections to people who live alone, she murmured. Resurrections of heart-wringing sorrows and ghosts of the past. I am glad that I insisted upon having the tree here, spinster though I am. Ten nieces and nephews with their respective guardians will make the rafters ring, and Lester, in the role of family friend, will relieve the Christmas dinner from the narrowness of a strictly family affair. I trust that my spirits will have regained their usual mercurial ascendancy. They are much below freezing point now. Miss Winslow's unrest was indefinite and therefore intangible. Only a discontent which assumes a specific form may be coped with, Mary Winslow's life had been too active to permit of self-analysis, so she did not probe her mood nor realize that pain sprang in her heart as it must in the heart of every true woman from the void which legions of friends only make more vacant, but which may be filled to overflowing by the magical presence of one. She had steadfastly refused all invitations to domicile with her married brothers, 
It would be very nice, she would admit, and the children would be brought up much better. Old maids are born disciplinarians. They never are overindulgent like grandparents. Grandparents should be seen and not heard. But you see, I enjoy too much being perfectly free. To appreciate liberty, one must have known slavery. Miss Winslow's early life had been spent in a bondage which, though loving, had nevertheless held her enchained. The unconsciously selfish exactings of an invalid mother had sentenced her to the shadows of a sick room and to an atmosphere heavy with drugs. When emancipation at last came, it was like breathing the pure sunshine for the first time. She took deep, invigorating draughts of the life of the world, enjoying her debut doubly because it had come nearly a decade late. And the world enjoyed her as much as she enjoyed the world. It was so accustomed to prematurely blasé types. What wonder it welcomed gladly one who was maturely young. The years might record her as a woman past the thirties. Spirit stamped her as a girl with a new-found capacity for life. When the souffle menu of society ceased to satisfy her, she traveled and beheld enthusiastically civilizations older than her own. The sight taught her to view life in its proper proportions and to realize the microscopic part in the plan of the grand whole which her own smart set enacted. She found pleasure in collecting curios, tapestries, and pictures. Upon her return, unrest still remaining importunate, she secured occupation and a kind of satisfaction in a diversion welcomed by people whose incomes increase in a ratio beyond their ability to disperse them. She built a magnificent home. Only those who know the delights and vexations of this form of diversion realize its absorption. Miss Winslow had her own ideas. So likewise had her architects. Her home must be characteristic, stamped, like her crested stationery, with the insignia of her personality. There was to be no such hideous deformity in it, for instance, she insisted, as a chandelier. The red library was lighted with swinging antique brass lanterns, hung in each corner and glowing softly with the pressing of a single switch. Other rooms had sidelights or curious lamps, one of them said to have belonged to a vestal virgin. The andirons in her hall were adorned with winged golden dragons, orlocks nefariously bribed from a Venetian gondolier. Norway contributed a beautiful dark bearskin, which was not treated to the ignominy of being trampled underfoot, but was stuffed and permitted to stand erect, a savage guardian of the entrance hall. Each room represented a different period, accurate in detail, only to be secured after long historical research. French and Italian palaces had been explored and treasures purchased, not for their intrinsic value, but for the part they had played in the comedy or tragedy of the world. Lester had been a great help to her in building her home. Lester was her brother's intimate friend and an architect of established fame. He enjoyed drawing her out to steal her ideas, he said, appreciating the rareness of her ingenuity and taste. The friendship she enjoyed with Lester was uncommon and a source of mutual satisfaction. Miss Winslow's experience of men was large and not wholly to their advantage. It was the inevitable penalty a woman with a fortune paid. She described Lester as an unusual man who was never in nor out of the way and who had no nonsense about him. This last was intelligible to her intimates. It meant that Lester had never made love to her. His good humor was unfailing, his optimism of the brightest hue. This last was not because he did not see the world's shadows, but rather because he possessed that larger vision which sees also the world's sunshine, and which obstinately refused to live anywhere but in it. He elevated the ideal above the real in thought and tried to maintain the relationship in fact. When success came, he bore it without undue elation, just as he had previously borne failure without undue despair. He was beloved by the few whom his discriminating taste would admit to the valued privilege of intimacy, and respected by all who would have liked to claim that distinction. 
Miss Winslow's labors were interrupted by a ring at the doorbell and an inquiring voice in the hall. Soon after, without presenting credentials, Lester appeared on the threshold of the library. At a glance, one felt that the scrupulously groomed man was unknown to marital responsibilities. The unlined, fresh-looking face bore the imprint of the irresponsible bachelor and clubman, and if his eyes sometimes suggested that life had not yet granted that which was most subtle, most satisfying, most craved, the philosopher's smile on the lips indicated the manner in which the knowledge had been born. "'Do you come in the role of Santa Claus?' Miss Winslow asked, glancing at the presents for the children which Lester and his servant were bringing in, and falling into the usual banter with which she and Lester were wont to play. "'And did you dust the chimney on the way down?' "'No. The modern Santa Claus comes in a horseless carriage with rubber tires,' he replied, carrying with one arm the Empire State Express and placing it beneath the tree. That explains the change in Christmas. I knew that it was not what it used to be. No, it's much better, he asserted. I tell you, we have overdone it, she reiterated. What is Christmas now in reality? A time when the person who cannot extract some fun out of it would better examine his mental machinery, he said, taking off his gloves. Miss Winslow scorned the rebuke. It is a time, she replied, answering her own question, which we forestall by working so hard that we are fit subjects for the rest cure when it gets here. It is merry in anticipation and melancholy in fact. Oh, of course, when you remember everyone who has ever bowed to you and all the inmates of the old ladies' homes besides. It is a time, she continued, when you receive a lot of things that you don't want and give away everything that you do. I'd better take my gift home then, he said, stooping and picking up a square package. It's only a first edition of Shelley, which... Which you happen very much to want, she laughingly finished. It was her turn to score. Don't ask me to take off my coat. I couldn't think of it, he said, divesting himself of the garment. I'm in a most unaccountable mood, she protested. You'll regret it if you stay. A few more regrets won't matter, he said, leisurely seating himself. Besides, you're only a sweet bell out of tune. She shook her head sadly at him. No, it won't do, Arthur. I'm not in a mood to be sugared. What is it all about, he asked, picking up a fierce-looking dagger, which had fallen to the humble estate of cutting magazines. I'm struggling under the startlingly new discovery that the moon is not made of green cheese. And, plaintively, you know I'm one of the few women who like my fromage green. Things are not what they seem. Oh, yes, they are. Your mood has gotten into your optics and tinged the lenses with blue. I feel as if life would be quite endurable if it were not for its pleasures, she continued. Golf is an elusive phantom. Cotillion's a torture. Why, as for people, she hesitated. Go on, he said encouragingly. Don't mind me. People are masqueraders, one and all. The good are wicked saints, and the bad are righteous sinners. I'll have to think before I decide in which class I'd rather be found. Go on, he said. I know there is more. I'm lonely, she replied obediently. That's nothing. I've been living that down for years. This barn of a house oppresses me. I warned you against making it perfection, said Lester, unsympathetically. I have succeeded in building an establishment. I have discovered that what I want is a home. Lester's lips emitted a low sound which might have been an exclamatory whistle. Is it really as bad as that, he inquired? I am afraid she is taking life seriously. Making epigrams is a sure sign. No, laugh and grow thin has been my motto. I've made a study of it. So have I, with different results. What is the secret of your success, he interrogated. Oh, it's not a secret. Like everything else nowadays, it's only a state of mind. Which implies that mine is suffering from fatty degeneration, he inquired. You will suffer from something worse if you remain. 
I am really unmistakably savage. Besides, I must finish the tree. By all means, but don't send me away. It is such an incomparable pleasure to see someone else work. Besides, do you know that I have a peculiar, physical, Madame Blavatsky sort of feeling that if I went, I should be doing irremediable injury to us both? In short, I refuse to go. So you don't feel that four walls in the fashionably crowded part of the city constitute a home? They are so much expensive paint and brick, she replied. You can say, he said, Homeless near a thousand homes I stood, and near a thousand tables pined and wanted food. Why will you persist in understanding one's mood? Miss Winslow asked grievously. You deprive one of the sweet misery of explaining. I feel as if this house were a museum. Everything has such an unused, creepy look. I have found that a home does not consist in having colonial and empire rooms, nor even in antiques like these, she waved her hands at the old mahogany of fashionably modern outline which adorned the library. Home lies in the spirit infused into it, and one woman's spirit, pathetically, will not cover a house of this size. There is one thing that I am seriously thinking of doing. I think I shall adopt an orphan child. An orphan asylum would fill it better, he commented. Miss Winslow went over to the table and lifted the cupid. Since you prefer me in a bad mood to anyone else in a holiday one, I must continue my work. What are you going to do with that dangerous boy? Lester asked, looking at the pink-faced cherub as she dangled him from a string held between finger and thumb. I am now about to hang Cupid, she said solemnly. How delightful! I have always wanted to be present at an execution. Besides, it's a fate I've often thought he deserved. You must have suffered a good deal at his hands, she said, looking sideways at him between half-closed lashes. That reminds me. I heard someone at the Hoyts' dance last night call you an artistic flirt. And what, may I ask, is a flirt, artistic or otherwise, Lester inquired with sparkling eyes. Miss Winslow thought for a moment. A flirt, she replied, is a man with a small capacity for loving every woman and a large incapacity for loving one. The laughter died from Lester's eyes. Do you believe that is true of me? he asked lightly. Miss Winslow did not reply. Do you really believe that of me? he asked more seriously. Miss Winslow moved uneasily. There was something in Lester's tone which she could not meet with the usual banter. Look at me, Mary, he said peremptorily. You can study the pattern of your rugs any time. Miss Winslow shot a swift glance at him, then lowered her lids again. Lester rose and came toward her. You have very pretty eyelashes. I have always admired them, he said, standing directly in front of her. But I want you to look at me and tell me if you honestly believe I have a large incapacity for loving one woman. Something new in his voice, something subtle and almost painful in the atmosphere, played havoc with Miss Winslow's usually well-adjusted mental processes. She felt silenced, paralyzed, almost afraid. When the silence became intolerable, being a woman of the world, she treated the occasion with the world's greatest emotional safeguard. She took refuge in a laugh. I impeach your power to catechize me, she said. Here, take your arch enemy, Cupid, and be revenged by hanging him high. He took the wax figure from her and stood as if in debate. Then he turned toward the tree and addressed the figure in his hand. Cupid, he said, I hang you with many apologies. I confess to a fondness for you, not shared by the lady of this manner. I shall suspend you high where you can keep a watchful eye upon her. Who knows? He broke off and ascended the steps. The universal God revolved slowly in midair in his new home on the tree, then settled into permanence of direction. See, Mary, Lester cried, looking over his shoulder. He is pointing his arrow at you. Have a care. 
As he said it, his foot, which was reaching backward for a lower step, miscalculated, and with a crash he fell heavily to the floor. "'Well, of all awkward brutes!' he exclaimed, regaining a sitting position where he remained with one foot under him. "'The trick elephant in the circus could have done better.' Miss Winslow's first inclination was to laugh. When Lester attempted to rise, however, and unconsciously emitted a groan, she flew at once to his side. "'Is it your foot? You've twisted and perhaps sprained it. Oh, if you had only gone before!' "'Don't, Mary. Don't hit a man when he's down. You may think the fall was retribution, but I attribute it to another cause,' he gave a glance at the cupid. That little rascal, I believe, knocked me down. He closed his eyes with pain. Miss Winslow's talent for emergencies came to the front. She summoned her man to help lift Lester to the couch, and then flew to the telephone and called a doctor. Her own physician responded. After the usual pullings, pinchings, and pressings, he cheerfully pronounced the wrench a very bad sprain. It will be a matter of weeks— "'Though hardly, I hope, of months,' he said amiably. "'You'd better have yourself moved where you can be made comfortable "'and be supplied with diverting companionship. "'These affairs are tedious at the best.' "'He offered his further services, "'which Miss Winslow, catching a telegraphic message from Lester's eyes, "'declined, saying that her man could do everything necessary. In a few moments she was alone with her guest, who sat helpless as a child with bandaged foot, elevated upon a tabaret in front of him. "'Well,' Miss Winslow said in some embarrassment, "'why did you not allow the doctor to accompany you home? Do you prefer the distraction of William's accent?' Lester contemplated his wounded foot. "'Mary,' he said, "'do you realize that we are facing a state of things?' I realize that you are. Well, be unselfish and imagine that you are, too. Do you think that a bachelor's apartment house, without a woman in sight, ideally fills the doctor's prescription? Of course I don't. It is most unfortunate. Oh, if your married sister did not live one hundred miles away. Yes, or if I could be expressed to her. You can have a nurse, she suggested but you will have to eat and sleep and wink on schedule, and you hate doing things by rule. Yes, and if she were not pretty, she would make one feel worse. And if she were, you'd fall in love with her. Not at all. But there's no telling what would happen to her. No, a woman nurse, I feel, is an anomaly. Then why not have a man? A man is a monstrosity. I should be at liberty to throw boots and vigorous invectives at him. But I am afraid I would be unfit for society at the end of the term. No, Mary, I see but one loophole. Fate has erected a signpost with a straight, clear path for you and me. For me, she echoed feebly. Yes, I have a proposition to make, a most logical solution. You wish to adopt someone. I am in need of a home. Do you not see that Providence has left a charge, not on your doorstep, but on your stepladder, as it were? No, I don't, she gasped. This foundling, he continued, has every requirement which your orphan child could not possess. You must have someone who understands your every peccadillo, who will not laugh when you sigh or weep when you are merry, who will not monopolize your favorite chair, be bored with Omar Khayyam, or sleep through the opera. Mary, we are all only children of a larger growth. Listen to fate, and save me from the doom of solitary confinement by adopting me. Did you sprain your brain as well as your ankle? Miss Winslow inquired. No, my senses are intact. But you don't mean... You didn't intend, she faltered. I certainly did. You always had unusual perspicacity. You may catalogue me as number 25, is it? I have had the honor to make you what the lady novelist terms an honorable proposal of marriage. Miss Winslow fell back in her chair. What more rational solution of a difficult problem, he continued. 
You are lonely and wish to adopt someone. I am sentenced to bachelor banishment for months. You wouldn't like to think of me fuming and fretting existence away, would you, when you might have prevented it? Miss Winslow leaned forward in her chair and quietly scanned his face. Then the blood flamed over her own, tipping even her close-set ears with crimson. Yes, he really means it, she said, musingly, and with reluctance. He has asked me to marry him, for convenience sake, and he does not realize how he has humiliated me. Yet that could be borne, but to be disappointed in him, one can never get used to that, and I thought he understood me. Then at a low exclamation from Lester, Oh, I give you credit for not intending to pain me. The awful part is not to know that you have. Do you realize what you have said? I have heard of men who married to obtain a housekeeper. It is a novelty to meet one who wishes a trained nurse. Lester's face flushed deeply. He opened his mouth to refute the injustice, but she would not let him begin. No, don't speak, she said. I am choking with the words I want to say. She met his gaze now with eyes from which vehement indignation flashed, and he sank back among the pillows of the couch. How dared you, she inquired with low, forcefully distinct enunciation. How dared you to speak to me of marriage and never speak of love? Do you think Forty outgrows it? She covered her hot cheeks with her hands. Let me say one thing more, as again he attempted to check her. Of course, we can't be friends after tonight. The bone camaraderie of our relationship is over. You have forever spoiled it. Your going will make a void in my life. I don't think I ever knew until tonight how large a place you filled. Her voice gave a little break, which she quickly controlled. You satisfied me because I thought you understood me. But the one vital thing you did not understand. Let me tell you now that you may know why I am so stung. I, Mary Winslow, spinster, with face turned toward the setting sun, demand of the man who would win me absorbing, all-compelling love. I am not a woman to bestow myself. I must be one, and it cannot be done with a jest. Lester's face had grown white as he listened. Sometimes he closed his eyes as if trying to shut out sound. Sometimes the hands on his knees moved a little. When he spoke, his voice was entirely without the intensity of tone she had used. It was the conversational tone of a stunned man, finding refuge in conventional phrase, the ever-blessed law of habit which prevents human tension from being stretched too far. I can't tell you how I regret having pained you, he finally said. It was the last thing I intended to do, and I am sorry not to have done well what I should like to have done the best of all. Yet, with a touch of whimsicality, I don't know that it is surprising. One can hardly expect a stage proposal from a man who has never made one before. Her eyes were fastened upon the tree. Her attitude indicated a polite but weary judge who was tolerantly waiting to hear what the defense might say. If I had not felt so deeply, I could have been more eloquent, he continued. We have played with words so long, it was hard to be serious, even when I most wished. I must have taken it for granted that you knew that I loved you. Women are either amazingly astute or incredibly blind in such matters. Why did you suppose I had haunted your hearth for nearly ten years? I think it began then when your mother was taken away. He spoke simply, as if relating a narrative long familiar, and one that should not surprise his listener. You will wonder why I never told you. It was because you came into your heritage late. I would not try to take it from you. You found your girlhood years later than most women. While your mother lived, her health held you in a bondage of love. When you entered the gay world, it was a fairyland to you. Like a girl, you enjoyed each moment. I would not rob you of one. I followed your enthusiasms, your disappointments, your triumphs, waiting until pleasure should fall. 
I wished you to find for yourself that the pretty bubbles you chased turned to air when you grasped them. When I came to night, I knew immediately that the mood I had longed for had come. You were heartsick and filled with satiety. The apples of Sodom were bitter in your mouth. I was so happy I could have shouted. For Mary, he leaned forward and spoke rapidly, it was love your soul was crying for, love the deepest need of human life, and what your heart was vaguely demanding, mine had long been throbbing to give. Do you know to what heights of folly I have been led by this masterful passion? Do you know that I go blocks out of my way at night to pass your window? Do you know that I visit barbaric receptions for a glimpse of your face? Can you realize the pangs of jealousy I suffer when I find you monopolized by some young cub whom in fancy I cuff and throw out at the door? His eyes rested on her and held her with resistless power. Think of the men who have loved you. Did you fancy I did not know when you turned them away? Love is keen. Mary, you do care, or you would not have been so stung by my cursed flippancy tonight. Don't try to answer me now. I will go home, and in spite of solitude, my Christmas will be the happiest I have ever known. Think of what I have said, and remember, your happiness and mine are at stake. Oh, Mary, gift of God to me, prayer and creed of my life, give me the right before the world to worship. Mary, Mary, sweetheart, don't cry. Reaction from her indignation had left Miss Winslow quiescent. When Lester spoke, incredulity and then amazement swept over her, followed by a peace which was subtle, restful, new. When his words came faster and faster, she felt herself swept along on their current and questioned not whither she was being born. After years of enforced repression, it was blissful to let herself go. That Christmas Eve, her beautiful home, her material possessions, had seemed but a background which intensified the poverty of her heart. She had unconsciously longed for those imperishable riches which now were laid at her feet, and deeper than the knowledge of what she would receive was the certainty of what she knew she could give. When Lester's voice broke with its new tenderness, her overtaxed nerves gave way and she sobbed like a child. The sight restored him to the safe path of the commonplace, and his next words were in the usual bantering tone. Well, of all things, that is the unkindest, to cry when I cannot reach you. Is that handkerchief a flag of truce? But he could not win her to smiles, Sob after sob filled the room, the pitiful, long-drawn sobs of childhood or of womanhood that retains the sensitive heart of the child. If you do not wish to break my heart, Mary, you will stop hurting me and come here at once. The doctor's infliction was nothing to this. Mary, I command you to come here. Then, as she did not heed him, he said in a voice in which each word was a caress, Mary, I have waited years patiently for you. See, I will not look. Will you not come to me in my distress? And obediently, with face still covered, like a little child, she came. End of Cupid at Forty by Mrs. Florence Gerton Tuttle Donald Fraser, sitting by the low four-paned window of his new house, was playing old Scotch airs on his fiddle to beguile dull time away on a cold winter afternoon, more than a hundred years ago. The place was a remote settlement in a nascent Canadian province where the settlers were engaged in the arduous task of carving out homes for themselves in the wilderness. Donald's new house had only four small rooms, but it was considered quite a pretentious edifice in those primitive days. Before it, the cleared fields of his farm sloped down to the ice-bound bay. Behind it, great woods stretched inland, intersected here and there by trails and wood roads. In winter, the ice was the great highway of traffic, and people from far and wide passed Donald's door, often calling to warm themselves before his fire and exchange news of the various scattered settlements. The day was bitter cold, and a storm threatened. Few travelers were abroad, and Donald had no callers. He felt lonely and got his fiddle down for company. 
was too early yet to go across the bay to Sherman's. Donald smiled to himself as he played Annie Laurie and thought of Nancy Sherman, more beautiful than the heroine of the old ballad. Her face it is the fairest that e'er the sun shone on, on the young Scotch-Canadian, softly. The Frasers were one of the best families in the little colony, which was as yet so thinly populated that everybody in it knew everybody else. Alexander Fraser, Donald's father, had been one of the earliest immigrants from Scotland. He was a man liked and respected by all, and had taken a prominent part in shaping the affairs of the colony. From him, Donald, his firstborn, inherited his broad shoulders, sandy hair, deep-set gray eyes, and resolute jaw. But it was from his Irish mother that Donald got the qualities which made him a favorite with all who knew him. The merry curve of his mobile mouth, the twinkle in his gray eyes, the gay smile, the flashing wit, the irrepressible good comradeship that distinguished him from the more reserved purebred Scotch folk. Even the faint suggestion of brogue in his ringing tones all contributed to form a personality which was destined to stamp its influence on those rude early days. Many a blue-eyed Scotch and English lassie would have been glad and willing to listen had Donald Fraser come a-wooing, and many a girlish heart of a hundred years ago beat quicker at his step or voice. But Donald cared only for one whom many others wooed likewise. He was not openly favored above his rivals. He did not know whether Nancy Sherman cared for him or not, but he knew that if she would not come to be the mistress of his new house, none other ever should. So he dreamed of her as he drew the bow over the strings and filled the low room with the sweetness of old lowland ballads, the fine frenzy of highland reels and strathpays, and the rollicking abandon of Irish jigs. When he played the last, the Irish fun in his nature overflowed him, drowning out the Scottish romance, and he wished that somebody would drop in and crack a joke with him. When he left the north window, which he liked best because it looked out over the bay to Sherman's, went to the south one, looking out over a dreary expanse of stumps and half-cleared land, he saw a sway emerge from the woods. He knew the driver at a glance, and rushing to the door, threw it open with hearty hospitality. Anyone would have been welcome, but this visitor was Neil Campbell, who was Donald's especial crony. Friends they had always been, and friends they were yet, and they were also rivals. People had expected to see their friendship blotted out by their rivalry, but it had stood the test. Each loved Nancy Sherman, and each knew that the other knew it. Each was determined to win her, and neither would have hesitated over any ruse that would give them the advantage. But no ill feeling found place between them, and when Neil came from Berwick, he always called to see Donald before he crossed the bay. And sometimes, so free from bitterness was their rivalry, he even took Donald over. He got out at the door and shook Donald's proffered hand, heartily. Then he tied his restive young mare to a post, threw the buffalo robe over her, and, and followed Donald into the kitchen. Neither in appearance nor character was there the slightest resemblance between the two men. In point of looks, Neil Campbell could not for an instant compare with Donald Fraser. He was smaller and slighter, with a dark, melancholy face and intensely blue eyes, the vivid blue of the St. Lawrence water on a windy autumn day, when the sun breaks out after a storm. In parentage he was pure Highland, with all the Highlanders' mystic poetic temperament. He was not so widely popular as the gay and dashing Donald, and he was not a favorite with women. But his few friends loved him rarely, and it was said by some that if a woman once loved him, she would do and dare all things to win him. Neil threw himself down before the roaring fire with a sigh of satisfaction. It was ten miles from Berwick to the bay shore, and, though a lover thought little of that when his lass waited for him at the end, a blazing backlog and a taste of good Scotch whiskey were not to be despised at the halfway station. "'It's cold the day,' he said briefly. "'You'll be going over the bay, I'm thinking,' said Donald, good-humouredly. A slight tinge of colour showed itself on Campbell's dark face. While he bore Donald no grudge for the rivalry, he could not refer to it in the unreserved way of his friend. To him, Donald's offhand way of looking at the situation savored of greater confidence than he possessed, and this stung him. He only nodded in reply to Donald's remark. The latter had meanwhile been rummaging in his untidy bachelor cupboard, 
now emerged with a bottle of whiskey and a couple of tumblers. This was a matter of course a hundred years ago. A woman might offer her woman friends a cup of hot tea, but a man treated his callers to a taste of the best whiskey obtainable. If he failed to do so, he was looked upon as seriously lacking in what were then considered the most rudimentary elements of hospitality. You look cold, said Donald. Set nearer to the fire, man, and let this put a bit of warmth in your veins. You'll need it before you go over the bay. It's bitter cold on the ice today. Now, for the Berwick news. Has Jean McLean made up with her man yet? And is it true that Sandy MacDonald is to marry Kate Ferguson? "'Twill be a match now, sure, and with her red hair, Sandy will not be like to lose his bride past finding. Berwick was Donald's boyhood home, and Neil had plenty of news for him concerning friends and kin. First he talked a little and cautiously, as was his wont, while Donald bantered and joked, but presently the whiskey, which neither spared, began to tell on the different temperaments. Donald's volatile spirits evaporated, and the Scotch element of his nature came uppermost. He grew cautious and watchful, talked less, but made shrewder remarks. The Highlander, on the contrary, lost his reserve and became more and more confidential. At last, after being shrewdly manipulated by Donald, Neil Campbell confessed that he meant to put his fate to the test that very night. He was going over the bay to ask Nancy Sherman to marry him. If she consented, then Donald and the rest should see a wedding such as the colony had never yet seen. Donald rose abruptly and went to the window, leaving Neil to sip his grog and gaze smilingly into the fire, with the air of a man very well satisfied with himself. As for Donald, he was for the moment nonplussed. This was worse than he had expected. He had never dreamed that Neil would dare bring matters to a crisis yet, but there was no time to be lost if he meant to get ahead of his rival. In his heart, Donald hoped that Nancy Sherman cared for him, what else could those modestly bestowed favors and shy looks, such as she gave to no other, mean? Yet he might be mistaken. She might like Neil best, after all. But whether or no, the first man there stood the better chance. Donald knew very well that Nancy's father favored Neil Campbell as being the richer man in worldly goods. If Neil asked Nancy to marry him when he, Donald, had not yet spoken, Eli Sherman would have the most to say in the matter, and Nancy would never dream of disputing her father's command. Donald looked far out over the bay, realized that his chance of winning Nancy depended on his crossing that white expanse before Neil did. How could it be managed? A twinkle came into Donald's eye, all was fair in love and war, and Nancy was well worth the trial. He went back to the table and sat down. Have some more, man, have some more, he said persuasively. Twill keep the life in you and the teeth of that wind. Help yourself. There's plenty more where that came from. Is it going over the bay the night that yourself will be doing? asked Neil as he obeyed. Donald shook his head. I had thought of it, he owned. But it looks a wee like a storm, and my sleigh is at the blacksmith's to be shod. If I went, it must be on Black Dan's back, and he'd like a canter over the ice in a snowstorm as little as I. His own fireside is by far the best place for a man to be tonight, Campbell. Neil nodded drowsily. His potations, after his long cold drive, were beginning to have their effect. Donald, with laughter in his deep-set eyes, watched his friend, and persuaded him again and again to have yet another tasting. When Neil's head at last fell heavily on his arm, Donald arose with the smile of a man who has won in a doubtful game. Neil Campbell was sound asleep, and would remain so for some time. How long was the question? might be for hours, and it might be for only a few minutes, but half an hour's start would be enough. For the rest it would depend on Nancy, but there was no time to lose. Donald flung on his stout homespun overcoat, pulled his fur cap warmly over his ears, and wrapped a knitted muffler of hand-spun yarn around his neck. Then he caught his mitts and riding whip from the nail over the fireplace, and strode to the door with a parting glance at the reclining figure of his unconscious friend. May your sleep be long and sweet, man, he laughed softly. As for the waking, twill be betwixt you and me. With an amused smile, he untied Neil's horse, climbed onto Neil's sleigh, and, and tucked Neil's buffalo robe comfortably around him. When he wakes, Black Dan will carry him as well as he would have carried me, thought the schemer. 
but if the snow comes after sunset, it's little we'll see of either over the bay tonight. Now, Bess, old girl, do your bonniest. There's more than you know hangs on your speed. If the Campbell awakes too soon, Black Dan could show you a pair of clean heels for all of your good start. On, my girl. Brown Bess, one of the best mares in the county, sprang forward over the ice like a deer. The sun was nearing its setting, the gleaming white expanse of the bay, gemmed here and there with wooded purple islets and rimmed in by dark violet coasts, glittered like the breast of a fair woman decked with jewels. Above the curdled gray rolls of cloud flushed faintly pink, but the north and east were gray with the presage of night and storm. Donald thought of none of these things, nor of the rare spiritual beauty of the waste about him. As he urged Brown Bess forward, with now and then a glance behind to see if Black Dan were yet following, he thought only of what he should say to Nancy Sherman, and of what her answer would be. The Shermans were a family of United Empire loyalists who had come to Canada at the close of the American War of Independence. They never spoke of their former fortunes, but it was the general opinion that they had once been wealthy. However that might be, they were poor enough now, and life was even a harder struggle for them than it was for the Scotch immigrants who had already obtained a footing on the Canadian soil. Elias Sherman was a genial, friendly soul, and his wife was a pale, proud woman who had once been beautiful and was dignified and gracious yet. When they came to the little maritime colony, they brought two children with them. These two children, Nancy and Betty, grew up amid many hardships and privations. But as they blossomed out into young womanhood, they were widely famed for their beauty. And lovers from the best and wealthiest of the colonial families came a-wooing to the little cottage on the bay shore, and thought themselves richly repaid if they won a smile or a kind glance from the beautiful Sherman girls. Beautiful and stately they were, indeed, with a grace and charm of manner that triumphed over mean attire and rough surroundings. A hundred years ago, Nancy and Betty Sherman, now sleeping forgotten in mossy, grass-grown graves on a hill that slopes down to the moaning St. Lawrence Gulf, had the pick of five counties to their hand. Not one of the blue-eyed, fresh-faced Scotch and English lassies, the Jeans and Kates and Margarets, could for a moment compare with them. They were envied bitterly enough, no doubt, and caused many a long-forgotten heartache. Yet the fault was not theirs. They made no effort to win or retain the homage offered them. The boldest lover never boasted of favors received. A kindly word or a gracious smile was all that any ever won, and was esteemed enough. Even Donald Fraser could but own to himself that Nancy was as likely to say no as yes. She had said it calmly and sweetly to better men. Well, he would face the question bravely, and if he were refused, Neil will have the laugh on me then. Sure, and he's sleeping well, and the snow is coming soon. There'll be a bonny swirl on the bay ere long. I hope no harm will come to the lad if he starts to cross. When he wakes, he'll be in such a fine highland temper that he'll never stop to think of danger. Well, Bess, my girl, here we are at last. Now, Donald Fraser, pluck up heart and play the man. Remember you're a Scotchman with a dash of old Ireland to boot. They never flinch because a slip of a lass looks scornful at you out of the bonniest dark blue eyes on earth. In spite of his bold words, however, Donald's heart was thumping furiously when he drove into the farmyard. Nancy was there, milking a cow by the stable door, but she stood up when she saw him coming, grasping her pail with one hand and holding the other out to him in the gracious, untroubled way for which she was noted. Haloed by the sunset light that was flinging its rosy splendors over all the wide, white waste around them, the girl was so beautiful that Donald's courage failed him almost completely. Was it not the wildest presumption to hope that this exquisite creature could care for him, or would come to be the mistress of his little house, she who was fit for a king's halls? In all the humility of a true lover he stood before her, and Nancy, looking into his bonny face, understood with woman's instinct why he had come. A color and light that was not of the sunset crept into her face and eyes. She did not withdraw her hand from his grasp, but she turned her face aside and bent her head. Donald knew that he must make the most of this unexpected chance. He might not see Nancy alone again before Neil came. 
Clasping both of his hands over the slender one he held, he said breathlessly, Nan, lass, I love you. You may say tis a hasty wooing, but that's a story I can tell you later, maybe. I know well I'm not worthy of you, but if true love could make a man worthy, there'd be none before me. Will you have me, Nan? Nan's head in its crimson shawl drooped lower still. For a moment Donald endured an agony of suspense. Then he heard an answer, oh, such a low, sweet answer, and he knew that she was one. The snow was beginning to fall when they walked together to the house. Donald looked over the bay, misty white in the gathering gloom, and laughed light-heartedly. I must tell you that story, my lass, he said, catching Nancy's look of wonder, and you'll see what a trick I played on my best friend to win you. And tell it he did, with such inimitable drollery and such emphasized brogue that Nancy could but laugh as heartily as he did. She was not proof against the humor of the situation, even amid the sweeter romance of it. When morning broke, the storm was over, and Donald knew that vengeance must be on his track. Not wishing to make the Sherman house the scene of a quarrel, he resolved to get away before a meal came, and he persuaded Nancy to drive with him to the country town, some ten miles away for a cali. As he brought Neil's sleigh up to the door, he saw a black speck far off on the bay and laughed. Black Dan goes well, but he'll not be quick enough, he said, as he helped Nancy in. Half an hour later, Neil Campbell, with a blackly bent brow and a fire in his blue eyes that was woe to see, dismounted from his smoking horse at the Sherman's door and strode into the kitchen. Had Donald Fraser been there, the comedy might shortly have been turned into a tragedy, for there was blood fury in Campbell's heart and eyes. But the wily rival was far away, and the kitchen was empty. Neil stood and chafed at the door until Mrs. Sherman came down the rude stairs from the loft above. At sight of Campbell she started in surprise, for though many a wooer came to her house, they did not usually come so early in the day, but she came forward to meet him in a gracious manner. Good morning, Mr. Campbell. Tis a fair day after the storm, but a cold. Come near to the fire. Neil felt his blind fury ebbing away before this woman of the queen-like presence and pale, sorrowful face, so little in keeping with the rude low room. Mrs. Sherman always imposed a sense of deference upon the person to whom she spoke. Neil could not bring himself to demand of her where Donald Fraser or Nancy was, yet he must say something. Where is Betty the morning? he asked, trying to speak calmly, although his voice shook. On being told that she had gone to the well for a pail of water, he went out, vowing that he would discover from her the whereabouts of his false friend. Betty Sherman saw him coming across the snow, and stood up directly beside the well, with a smile on her face. Her lips parted, and her breath fluttered over them quickly. She put up her slender brown hands, and nervously, caught the crimson fringes of her knitted shawl together under her chin, while into her eyes leaped the strange light of fear and passion, and some undefined emotion that strove to conquer the other two. As far as feature and bearing went, Nancy and Betty Sherman looked marvelously alike, yet so different were they in coloring it, more than all in expression, that they were scarcely held to resemble each other. The hair that lay in skeins of silken fairness on Nancy's white forehead rippled off from Betty's in locks as richly brown as October nuts. The misty purple of Nan's eyes was so dark and deep in Betty's as to be almost black, and while Nancy was oftener paler than not, a dusky red always glowed in Betty's cheeks, and deepened to scarlet in the curves of a very sweet, very scornful mouth. As for their expression, Nancy's was always generous and charming, while Betty's was mocking and maddening. Though Betty had many lovers, they were afraid of her. Her tongue was a sharp and unsparing one, and she satirized them to their faces. Woe betide the rash youth with a squint or a stutter who came courting Betty Sherman. And even those who had no defect of person or manner fared little better. Yet came they did, for there was that about the girl that held a man, though she treated him, as the dust under her feet. When Neil Campbell had first come to the cottage on the bay shore, it had been Betty whom he came to see. In those days he thought Nan by far the less bonny, but Betty, always cruel to her suitors, was doubly so to Neil. 
She mimicked his highland accent, mocked at his highland ways, and laughed at his shyness as highland pride. Neil, believing his suit hopeless, left the scornful maid to her own devices, was gradually drawn into the train of Nancy's lovers, soon to become the most devoted of them. Thenceforth, Betty had treated him with unvarying indifference, although generally she was as merciless to Nancy's lovers as to her own. Neil felt that his humiliation would be doubly bitter from Betty's probable railing, but in his passionate anger, an anger that quite overmastered the sting of baffled love, he did not care what she might say. "'Good morning, Mr. Campbell,' said Betty's silver-clear voice as he came up to her. "'It's early abroad you are, and I'm Black Dan no less. Was I mistaken in thinking that Donald Fraser said that his favorite horse should never be backed by any man but him? But doubtless a fair exchange is no robbery, and Brown Bess goes well and fleetly.' "'Where is Donald Fraser?' said Neil, thickly. "'It is him I am seeking.' and it is him I will be finding. Where is he, Betty Sherman? Donald Fraser is far enough away by this, said Betty, lightly. He is a prudent fellow, that Donald, and has some quickness of wit under that sandy thatch of his. He came here last night at sunset with a horse and sleigh, not his own or lately gotten, and he asked Dan in the stable yard to marry him. Did a man ask me to marry him while I was at the cow's side with my milking pail in my hand? "'Tis a cold answer he'd get for his pains. "'But Nan was ever or fond of Donald, "'and tis kindly she must have answered him, "'for they sat late together last night, "'and t'was a bonny story that Nan wakened me to hear "'when she came to bed, "'the story of a braw lover "'who let his secret out when the whiskey was a bone the wit, "'and then fell asleep while his rival was away "'to woo and win his lass. "'Did you ever hear a like story, Mr. Campbell?' "'Neil clenched his fists.' Oh, yes, he said fiercely. It is laughing at me over the countryside that Donald Fraser will be doing and telling that story. But when I meet him, it is not laughing he will be doing. Oh, no, there will be another story to tell. What will you do to him? cried Betty in alarm. Don't meddle with a man. Now what a state to be in, because a slip of a good-looking lass prefers sandy hair and gray eyes to hide in black and blue. You have not the spirit of a wren, Neil Campbell. Were I you, I would show Donald Fraser that I could woo and win a maid as speedily as any lowlander of them all. That would I. There's many a girl would say, yes, gladly for your asking. I know one myself, as bonny as Nan, if folks say true, who would think herself a proud and happy woman if you looked kindly on her, who would love you as well as Nan loves her Donald, ay, and ten times better. Betty's face went crimson and her eyes faltered down to the pail at her feet. "'And who may it be, Betty?' asked Neil after a brief silence. Betty did not answer in words. She came a step nearer and put one hand on Neil's shoulder, with her head still drooping, but looking up at him with her eyes and an expression, half defiant, half yielding, wholly captivating, that answered as plainly as words. Neil took the two cold hands in his... If this be so, lass, he said gently, why did you mock at me so when I came first? What simpletons men are, pouted Betty. Why, t'was because I like you best, to be sure. Then she suddenly sprang away from him with flushing cheeks and clouded eyes. Oh, what must you think of me, she cried. Bold, unmaidenly, that is what you will call me, and truly. But when I saw you coming, and I had loved you so long, what thought I to lose all for want of one little bold word? "'Twas hard to speak, but I have spoken it, and now you will despise me.' She clasped her hands and stood meekly before him, with her face hanging on her breast. Neil came nearer and drew her into his arms. "'Thank you for that word,' he said simply. "'Betty, it was you that I liked best at first, and if you will marry me, it is a good husband I will try to make you, and proud and a happy man I'll be.' Betty looked up at him with eyes where tenderness and mischief were mingled. And maybe Donald Fraser will not do so much laughing after all, she said. Look, you, Neil, leave me to manage this. When Nan comes back, I'll say to her, Nan, is Donald so very sure that Neil Campbell said your name when he told you of his errand? Tis a mistake your lowlander has made, sister. And then I will tell her how you came this morning and asked me to marry you, though twas I did the asking, was it not? 
but I'll not tell her that. End of A Pioneer Woman by L. M. Montgomery. A Rainy Evening, a sketch from Love After Marriage and Other Stories of the Heart by Mrs. Carolyn Lee Hentz. A pleasant little group was gathered around Uncle Ned's domestic hearth. He sat on one side of the fireplace opposite Aunt Mary, who, with her book in her hand, watched the children seated at the table, some reading, others sewing, all occupied, but one, a child of larger growth, a young lady who, being a guest in the family, was suffered to indulge in the pleasures of idleness without reproof. Oh, I love a rainy evening, said little Anne, looking up from her book and meeting her mother's smiling glance. It is so nice to sit by a good fire and hear the rain pattering against the windows. Only I pity the poor people who have no house to cover them to keep off the rain and the cold. And I love a rainy evening, too, cried George, a boy of twelve. I can study so much better. My thoughts stay at home and don't keep rambling off after the bright moon and stars. My heart feels warmer, and I really believe I love everybody better than I do when the weather is fair. Uncle Ned smiled and gave the boy an approving pat on the shoulder. Everyone smiled, but the young lady, who with a languid, discontented air, now played with a pair of scissors, now turned over the leaves of a book, then, with an ill-suppressed yawn, leaned idly on her elbow and looked into the fire. And what do you think of a rainy evening, Elizabeth? asked Uncle Ned. I should like to hear your opinion also. I think it is over dull and uninteresting indeed, answered she. I always feel so stupid I can hardly keep myself awake. One cannot go abroad or hope to see company at home and one gets so tired of seeing the same faces all the time. I cannot imagine what George and Anne see to admire so much in a disagreeable rainy evening like this. Supposing I tell you a story to enliven you, said Uncle Ned. Oh, yes, Father, please tell us a story, exclaimed the children simultaneously. Little Anne was perched upon his knee as if by magic, and even Elizabeth, moved her chair as if excited to some degree of interest. George still held his book in his hand, but his bright eyes, sparkling with unusual animation, were riveted upon his uncle's face. I'm going to tell you a story about a rainy evening, said Uncle Ned. Oh, that will be so pretty, cried Anne, clapping her hands. But Elizabeth's countenance fell below zero. It was an ominous annunciation. Yes, continued Uncle Ned, a rainy evening. But though clouds darker than those which now met the sky were lowering abroad, and the rain fell heavier and faster, the rainbow of my life was drawn most beautifully in those dark clouds, and its fair colors still shine most lovely on the sight. It is no longer, however, the bow of promise but the realization of my fondest dreams. George saw his uncle cast an expressive glance towards the handsome matron in the opposite corner, whose color perceptibly heightened, and he could not forbear exclaiming, Ah, Aunt Mary is blushing. I understand uncle's metaphor. She is his rainbow, and he thinks life one long rainy day. Not exactly so. I mean your last conclusion. But don't interrupt me, my boy, and you shall hear a lesson which, young as you are, I trust you will never forget. When I was a young man, I was thought quite handsome. Pa is as pretty as he can be now, interrupted little Anne, passing her hand fondly over his manly cheek. Uncle Ned was not displeased with the compliment, for he pressed her closer to him while he continued. Well, when I was young, I was of a gay spirit and a great favorite in society. The young ladies liked me for a partner in the dance, uh, the chessboard, uh, or the evening walk, and I had reason to think several of them would have made no objection to take me as a partner for life. Among all my young acquaintances, there was no one whose companionship was more pleasing as that of a maiden whose name was Mary. 
Now, there are a great many Marys in the world, so you must not take it for granted, I mean your mother or aunt. At any rate, you must not look so significant till I have finished my story. Mary was a sweet and lovely girl, with a current of cheerfulness running through a disposition that made music as it flowed. It was an undercurrent, however, always gentle and kept within its legitimate channel, never overflowing into boisterous mirth or unmeaning levity. She was the only daughter of a mother, and she a widow. Mrs. Carlton, such as was her mother's name, was in lowly circumstances, and Mary had none of the appliances of wealth and fashion to decorate her person or gild her home. A very modest competency was all her portion, and she wished for nothing more. I have seen her in a simple white dress, without a single ornament unless it was a natural rose, transcend all the gaudy belles who sought by the attraction to dress to win the admiration of the multitude but alas for poor human nature. One of these dashing bells so fascinated my attention that the gentle Mary was for a while forgotten. Teresa Vane was, indeed, a rare piece of mortal mechanism. Her figure was the perfection of beauty, and she moved as if strung upon wires, so elastic and springing were her gestures. I never saw such lustrous hair. It was perfectly black and shone like burnished steel. And then such ringlets, how they waved and rippled down her beautiful neck. She dressed with the most exquisite taste, delicacy, and neatness, and whatever she wore assumed a peculiar grace and fitness, as if art loved to adorn what nature made so fair. But what charmed me most was the sunshiny smile that was always waiting to light up her countenance. To be sure, she sometimes laughed a little too loud, but then her laugh was so musical and her teeth so white, it was impossible to believe her guilty of rudeness or want of grace. Often when I saw her in social circle, so brilliant and smiling, the life and charm of everything around her, I thought how happy the constant companionship of such a being would make me, what brightness she would impart to the fireside of home, what light, what joy to the darkness scenes of existence. Oh, uncle, interrupted George, laughing, if I were Aunt Mary, I would not let you praise any other lady so warmly. You are so taken up with her beauty, you have forgotten all about the rainy evening. Aunt Mary smiled, but it is more than probable that George really touched one of the hidden springs of her woman's heart for she looked down and said nothing. Don't be impatient, said Uncle Ned, and you shall not be cheated out of your story. I have began for Elizabeth's sake rather than yours, and I see she is wide awake. She thinks I was by this time more than half in love with Theresa Vane, and she thinks more than half right. <laughs> there had been a great many parties of pleasure, riding parties, sailing parties, and talking parties, and the summer slipped by almost unconsciously. At length the autumnal equinox approached, and gathering clouds, northeastern gales, and drizzling rains succeeded to the soft breezes, mellow skies, and glowing sunsets peculiar to that beautiful season. For two or three days I was confined within doors by the continuous rains, and I am sorry to confess it, but the blue devils actually got complete possession of me. One strided upon my nose, another danced on the top of my head, one pinched my ear, and another turned somersaults on my chin. You laugh, little Danny, but they are terrible creatures, these blue gentlemen, and I could not endure them any longer. So the third rainy evening I put on my overcoat, buttoned it up to my chin, and taking my umbrella in my hand, set out in the direction of Mrs. Vane's. Here, I thought, as my fingers pressed the latch, I shall find the moonlight smile that will illuminate the darkness of my night. The dull vapors were dispersed before her radiant glance, and this interminable equinoctial storm shall be transformed into a mere vertical shower, melting away in sunbeams at her presence. My gentle knock not being apparently heard, I stepped into the anteroom, set down my umbrella, 
took off my drenched overcoat, arranged my hair in the most grateful manner, and claiming a privilege to which perhaps I had no legitimate right, opened the door of the family sitting room and found myself in the presence of the beautiful Teresa. Here Uncle Med made a provoking pause. Pray go on. How is she dressed? And was she glad to see you? Assailed him on every side. How was she dressed? Repeated he. I am not very well skilled in the technicalities of a lady's wardrobe, but I can give you the general impression of her personal appearance. In the first place, there was a jumping up in an offhand sliding steps towards the opposite door as I entered, but a disobliging chair was in the way, and I was making my lowest bow before she found an opportunity of disappearing. Confused and mortified, she scarcely returned my salutation, while Mrs. Vane offered me a chair and expressed in somewhat dubious terms their gratification at such an unexpected pleasure. I have no doubt Teresa wished me at the bottom of the frozen ocean, if I might judge by the freezing glances she shot at me through her long lashes. She sat uneasily in her chair, trying to conceal her slip-shod shoes and furtively arranging her dress about the shoulders and waist. It was a most rebellious subject, for the body and the skirt were at open warfare, refusing to have any communion with each other. Where was the graceful shape I had so much admired? In vain I sought its exquisite outlines in the folds of that loose slovenly robe. Where were those glistening ringlets and burnished locks that had so lately rivaled the tresses of Medusa? Her hair was put in tangled bunches behind her ears and tucked up behind a kind of Gordian knot which would have required the sword of an Alexander to untie. Her frock was a soiled and dingy silk with trimmings of sallow blonde and a faded fancy handkerchief was thrown over one shoulder. "'You have caught me completely en disable,' said she, recovering partially from embarrassment. "'But the evening was so rainy, and no one but mother and myself I never dreamed of such an exhibition of gallantry as this.' She could not disguise the vexation with all her efforts to conceal it, and Mrs. Vane evidently shared her daughter's chagrin. I was wicked enough to enjoy their confusion, and never appeared more at my ease or played the agreeable with more signal success. I was disenchanted at once, and my mind reveled in its recovered freedom. My goddess had fallen from the pedestal on which my imagination had enthroned her, despoiled of the beautiful drapery which had imparted to her such ideal loveliness. I knew that I was a favorite in the family, for I was wealthy and independent, and perhaps of all Teresa's admirers, what the world would call the best match. I maliciously asked her to play on the piano, but she made a thousand excuses, studiously keeping back the true reason, her disordered attire. I asked her to play a game of chess, but she had a headache. She was too stupid. She never could do anything on a rainy evening. At length I took my leave, inwardly blessing the moving spirit which had led me abroad that night, that the spell which had so long enthralled my senses might be broken. Teresa called up one of her lambent smiles as I bade her adieu. Never call again on a rainy evening, she said sportively. I am always so wretchedly dull. I believe I was born to live among the sunbeams, the moonlight, and the stars. Clouds will never do for me. Amen, I silently responded as I closed the door. While I was putting on my coat, I overheard, without the smallest intention of listening, a passionate exclamation from Teresa. Good heavens, mother, was there ever anything so unlucky? I never thought of seeing my neighbor's dog tonight, if I have not been completely caught. I hope you will mind my advice next time, replied her mother in a grieved tone. I told you not to sit in that slovenly dress. I have no doubt you have lost him forever. Here I made good my retreat, not wishing to enter the pentronalia of family secrets. The rain still continued unabated, but my social feelings were very far from being dampened. I had the curiosity to make another experiment. 
The evening was not very far advanced, and as I turned from Mrs. Vane's fashionable mansion, I saw a modest light glimmering in the distance, and I hailed it as the shipwrecked mariner hails the star that guides him o'er ocean's foam to the home he has left behind. Though I was gay and young, and a passionate admirer of beauty, I had very exalted ideas of domestic felicity. I knew that there was many a rainy day in life, and I thought the companion who was born alone for sunbeams and moonlight would not aid me to dissipate their gloom. I had, moreover, a shrewd suspicion that the daughter who thought it a sufficient excuse for shameful personal neglect that there was no one present but her mother would, as a wife, be equally regardless of a husband's presence. While I pursued these reflections, my feet involuntarily drew nearer and more near to the light, which had been the lodestone of my opening manhood. I had continued to meet Mary in the gay circles I frequented, but I had lately become almost a stranger to her home. Shall I be a welcome guest, I said to myself as I crossed the threshold. Shall I find her in dishemblée? likewise, and discover that feminine beauty and grace are incompatible with a rainy evening. I heard a sweet voice reading aloud as I opened the door, and I knew it was the voice which was once music to my ears. Mary rose at my entrance, laying her book quietly on the table, and greeted me with a modest grace and self-possession peculiar to herself. She looked surprised and a little embarrassed, but very far from being displeased. She made no allusion to my estrangement or neglect, expressed no astonishment in my untimely visit, nor once hinted that, being alone with her mother and not anticipating visitors, she thought it unnecessary to wear the habiliments of a lady. Never in my life had I seen her look so lovely. Her dress was perfectly plain, but every fold was arranged by the hand of the graces. Her dark brown hair, which had a natural wave in it, now uncurled by the dampness, was put back in smooth ringlets from her brow, revealing a face which did not consider its beauty wasted because a mother's eye alone rested on its bloom. A beautiful cluster of autumnal roses placed in a glass vase on the table perfumed the apartment, and a bright blaze on the hearth diffused a spirit of cheerfulness around while it relieved the atmosphere of its excessive moisture. Mrs. Carlton was an invalid, and suffered also from an inflammation of the eyes. Mary had been reading aloud to her from her favorite book. What do you think it was? It was a very old-fashioned one indeed, no other than the Bible. And Mary was not ashamed to have such a fashionable young man as I then was, to see what her occupation had been. What a contrast to the scene I had just quitted. How I loathed myself for the infatuation which had led me to prefer the artificial graces of a bell to this pure child of nature. I drew my chair to the table and entreated that they would not look upon me as a stranger, but as a friend anxious to be restored to the forfeited privileges of an old acquaintance. I was understood in a moment, and without a single reproach was admitted again to confidence and familiarity. The hours I had wasted with Teresa seemed like a kind of mesmeric slumber, a blank in my existence, or at least a feverish dream. "'What do you think of a rainy evening, Mary?' I asked before I left her. "'I love it of all things,' replied she with animation. "'There is something so home-drawing, so heart-knitting in its influence. The dependencies which bind us to the world seem withdrawn, and retiring within ourselves, we learn more of the deeper mysteries of our own being. Mary's soul beamed from her eye as it turned with the transient obliquity towards heaven. She paused as if fearful of unsealing the fountains of her heart. I said that Mrs. Carlton was an invalid and consequently retired early to a chamber. But I lingered till a late hour, nor did I go till I had made a full confession of my folly, repentance, and awakened love. And as Mary did not shut the door in my face, you may imagine she was not sorely displeased. Ah, I knew who Mary was. I knew it all the time, exclaimed George, looking archly at Aunt Mary. A bright tear, which at that moment fell into her lap showed that, though a silent, 
She was no uninterested auditor. You have it done, father, said little Anne in a disappointed tone. I thought you were going to tell a story. You have been talking about yourself all the time. I have been something of an egotist, to be sure, my little girl, but I wanted to show my dear young friend here how much might depend upon a rainy evening. Life is not made all of sunshine. The happy and most prosperous must have their seasons of gloom and darkness, and woe be it to those from whom souls no rays of brightness emanate to gild those darkened hours. I bless the God of the rain as well as of the sunshine. I can read his mercy and his love as well as in his tempest, whose wings obscure the visible glories of his creations, as in the splendor of the rising sun or the soft dews that descend after his setting radiance. I began with a metaphor. I said a rainbow was drawn on the clouds that lowered in that eventful day, and that it still continued to shine with undiminished beauty. Woman, my children, was sent by God to be the rainbow of man's darker destiny. From the glowing red, emblematic of that love which warms and gladdens his existence, to the violet melting into the blue of heaven, symbolical of the faith which links him to a pure world, her blending virtues, mingling with each other in beautiful harmony, are a token of God's mercy here, and an earnest future blessings in those regions where no rainy evenings ever come to obscure the brightness of eternal day. End of A Rainy Evening, a sketch from Love After Marriage and Other Stories of the Heart by Mrs. Carolyn Lee Hentz Springtime a la carte by O. Henry It was a day in March. Never, never begin a story this way when you write one. No opening could possibly be worse. It is unimaginative, flat, dry, and likely to consist of mere wind. But in this instance, it is allowable. For the following paragraph, which should have inaugurated the narrative, is too wildly extravagant and preposterous to be flaunted in the face of the reader without preparation. Sarah was crying over her bill of fare. Think of a New York girl shedding tears on the menu card. To account for this, you will be allowed to guess that the lobsters were all out, or that she had sworn ice cream off during Lent, or that she had ordered onions or that she had just come from a Hackett matinee. And then, all these theories being wrong, you will please let the story proceed. The gentleman who announced that the world was an oyster, which he, with his sword, would open, made a larger hit than he deserved. It is not difficult to open an oyster with a sword. But did you ever notice anyone trying to open the terrestrial bivalve with a typewriter? like to wait for a dozen raw open that way? Sarah had managed to pry apart the shells with her unhandy weapon far enough to nibble a wee bit at the cold and clammy world within. She knew no more shorthand than if she had been a graduate in stenography just let slip upon the world by a business college. So, not being able to stenog, she could not enter that bright galaxy of office talent. She was a freelance typewriter and canvassed for odd jobs of copying. The most brilliant and crowning feat of Sarah's battle with the world was the deal she made with Schulenberg's home restaurant. The restaurant was next door to the old red brick in which she hall-roomed. One evening, after dining at Schulenberg's 40-cent, five-course, table d'hôte, served as fast as you can throw the five baseballs at the colored gentleman's head, Sarah took away with her the bill of fare. It was written in an almost unreadable script, neither English nor German, and so arranged that if you were not careful, you began with a toothpick and rice pudding and ended with soup and the day of the week. The next day, Sarah showed Schulenberg a neat card on which the menu was beautifully typewritten with the viands temptingly marshaled under their right and proper heads, from hors d'oeuvres to not responsible for overcoats and umbrellas. Schulenberg became a naturalized citizen on the spot, 
Before Sarah left him, she had him willingly committed to an agreement. She was to furnish typewritten bills of fare for the 21 tables in the restaurant, a new bill for each day's dinner, and new ones for breakfast and lunch as often as changes occurred in the food or as neatness required. In return for this, Schulenberg was to send three meals per diem to Sarah's hall room by a waiter, an obsequious one if possible, and furnish her each afternoon with a pencil draft of what fate had in store for Schulenberg's customers on the morrow. Mutual satisfaction resulted from the agreement. Schulenberg's patrons now knew what the food they ate was called, even if its nature sometimes puzzled them, and Sarah had food during a cold, dull winter, which was the main thing with her. And then the almanac lied and said that spring had to come. Spring comes when it comes. The frozen snows of January still lay like adamant in the crosstown streets. The hand organs still played in the good old summertime with their December vivacity and expression. Men began to make 30-day notes to buy Easter dresses. Janitors shut off the steam. And when these things happen, one may know that the city is still in the clutches of winter. One afternoon, Sarah shivered in her elegant hall bedroom. House heated, scrupulously clean, conveniences seemed to be appreciated. She had no work to do except Schulenberg's menu cards. Sarah sat in her squeaky willow rocker and looked out the window. The calendar on the wall kept crying to her, Springtime is here, Sarah. Springtime is here, I tell you. Look at me, Sarah. My figures show it. You've got a neat figure yourself, Sarah. Uh, nice springtime figure. Why do you look out the window so sadly? Sarah's room was at the back of the house. Looking out the window, she could see the windowless red brick wall of the box factory on the next street. But the wall was clear as crystal and Sarah was looking down a grassy lane shaded with cherry trees and elms and bordered with raspberry bushes and Cherokee roses. Spring's real harbingers are too subtle for the eye and ear. Some must have the flowering crocus, the wood-starring dogwood, the voice of a bluebird. Even so gross a reminder is the farewell handshake of the retiring buckwheat and oyster before they can welcome the lady in green to their dull bosoms. But to old earth's choicest kin, there come straight, sweet messages from his newest bride, telling them they shall be no stepchildren unless they choose to be. On a previous summer, Sarah had gone into the country and loved a farmer. In writing your story, never hark back thus. It is bad art and cripples interest. Let it march, march. Sarah stayed two weeks at Sunnybrook Farm. There she learned to love old Farmer Franklin's son, Walter. Farmers have been loved and wedded and turned out to grass in less time. But young Walter Franklin was a modern agriculturist. He had a telephone in his cowhouse, and he could figure up exactly what effect next year's Canada wheat crop would have on potatoes planted in the dark of the moon. It was in this shaded and raspberry lane that Walter had wooed and won her, and together they had sat and woven a crown of dandelions for her hair. He had immoderately praised the effect of the yellow blossoms against her brown tresses, and she had left the chaplet there and walked back to the house, swinging her straw sailor in her hands. They were to marry in the spring, at the very first signs of spring, Walter said, and Sarah came back to the city to pound her typewriter. A knock at the door dispelled Sarah's visions of that happy day. A waiter had brought the rough pencil draft of the home restaurant's next day fare in old Schoenberg's angular hand. Sarah sat down at her typewriter and slipped a card between the rollers. She was a nimble worker. Generally, in an hour and a half, the 21 menu cards were written and ready. Today, there were more changes on the bill of fare than usual. The soups were lighter. Pork was eliminated from the entrees, figuring only with Russian turnips among the roasts. 
the gracious spirit of spring pervaded the entire menu. Lamb, that lately capered on the greening hillsides, was becoming exploited with the sauce that commemorated its gambrels. The song of the oyster, though not silenced, was diminuendo con amore. The frying pan seemed to be held inactive behind the beneficent bars of the broiler. The pie list swelled. The richer puddings had vanished. The sausage, with his drapery wrapped about him, barely lingered in a pleasant thanatopsis with the buckwheats and the sweet but doomed maple. Sarah's fingers danced like midgets above a summer stream. Down through the courses she worked, giving each item its position according to its length and with an accurate eye. Just above the desserts came the list of vegetables. Carrots and peas, asparagus on toast, the perennial tomatoes and corn and succotash, lima beans, cabbage, and then. Sarah was crying over her bill of fare. Tears from the depths of some divine despair rose in her heart and gathered to her eyes. Down went her head on the little typewriter stand, and the keyboard rattled a dry accompaniment to her moist sobs. For she had received no letter from Walter in two weeks, and the next item on the bill of fare was dandelions. Dandelions with some kind of egg, but bother the egg. Dandelions, with whose golden blooms Walter had crowned her his queen of love and future bride. Dandelions, the harbingers of spring, her sorrow's crown of sorrow, reminder of her happiest days. Madam, I dare you to smile until you suffer this test. Let the marshal kneel roses that Percy brought you on the night you gave him your heart be served as a salad with French dressing before your eyes at a Schulenburg table d'hote. Had Juliet so seen her love tokens dishonored, the sooner would she have sought the lethal herbs of the good apothecary. But what a witch is spring! Into the great cold city of stone and iron a message had to be sent. There was none to convey it but the little hearty courier of the fields with his rough green coat and modest air. He is a true soldier of fortune, this Dentillon, this lion's tooth, as the French chefs call him. Flowered, he will assist at love-making, wreathe in milady's nut-brown hair. Young and callow and unblossomed, he goes into the boiling pot and delivers the word of his sovereign mistress. By and by, Sarah forced back her tears. The cards must be written, but still in a faint golden glow from her dandelionine dream, she fingered the typewriter keys absently for a little while with her mind and heart in the meadow lane with her young farmer. But soon she came swiftly back to the rock-bound lanes of Manhattan, and the typewriter began to rattle and jump like a strikebreaker's motor car. At six o'clock, the waiter brought her dinner and carried away the typewritten bill of fare. When Sarah ate, she set aside with a sigh the dish of dandelions with its crowning ovarious accompaniment. As this dark mass had been transformed from a bright and love-endorsed flower to be an ignominious vegetable, so had her summer hopes wilted and perished. Love may, as Shakespeare said, feed on itself, but Sarah could not bring herself to eat the dandelions that had graced as ornaments the first spiritual banquet of her heart's true affection. At 7.30, the couple in the next room began to quarrel. The man in the room above sought for A on his flute. The gas went a little lower. Three coal wagons started to unload the only sound of which the phonograph is jealous. Cats on the back fences slowly retreated towards Muckton. By these signs, Sarah knew it was time for her to read. She got out the cloister and the hearth, the best non-selling book of the month, settled her feet on her trunk, and began to wander with Gerard. The front door bell rang. The landlady answered it. Sarah left Gerard and Denny's treed by a bear and listened. Oh, yes, you would, just as she did. 
And then a strong voice was heard in the hall below, and Sarah jumped for her door, leaving the book on the floor in the first round easily the bears. You have guessed it. She reached the top of the stairs just as her farmer came up, three at a jump, and reaped and garnered her with nothing left for the gleaners. Why haven't you written? Oh, why? cried Sarah. New York's a pretty large town, said Walter Franklin. I came in a week ago to your old address and found that you went away on a Thursday. That consoled some and eliminated the possible Friday bad luck. But it didn't prevent my hunting for you with police and otherwise ever since. I wrote, said Sarah vehemently. Never got it. Then how did you find me? The young farmer smiled a springtime smile. I dropped into that home restaurant next door this evening, said he. I don't care who knows it. I like a dish of some kind of greens at this time of the year. I ran my eye down that nice typewritten bill of fare looking for something in that line. When I got below cabbage, I turned my chair over and hollered for the proprietor. He told me where you lived. I remember, sighed Sarah happily. That was dandelions below the cabbage. I know that cranky capital W way above the line your typewriter makes anywhere in the world, said Franklin. Why, there's no W in dandelions, said Sarah in surprise. The young man drew the bill of fare from his pocket and pointed to a line. Sarah recognized the first card she had typewritten that afternoon. There was still the rayed splotch in the upper right-hand corner where a tear had fallen. But over the spot where one should have read the name of the meadow plant, the clinging memory of their golden blossoms had allowed her fingers to strike strange keys. Between the red cabbage and the stuffed green peppers was the item, Dearest Walter, with hard-boiled egg. End of Spring a la carte by O. Henry.